So let's give it up for Emigdio. But actually, it's an honor to be here and sharing with you all this conversation because, in my tradition, before we can start any type of the activity, we say, oh, we have to ask him permission to the Creator and the Spirits. Because uh, thanks to them, we have this land, ten thanks to them, we have the water, we thank to them, we have the air where we breathe in. But actually, we say, Tupa Kapita Macha, Anti Huyu Pronta Amita, Anti Suyu, Conti Suyu, Chincha Suyu, Colla Suyu, Tata Inti, Mamakilla, Hup Anta, is to pick Halatupi, Anta Mamita Pachamama, Huliti Hainti, is to Inti Halata, who is into Hapa, Ato. But anyway, when we Look in this type of the things. I want to say to you know before I start to talk, they pass so many of these people and making memories about the work and the activities, all these type of the things. Over here in all this group of the people, so many people they have so much activity and giving to the to this to this world. Many of us we looking. We're looking for the, you know, for have a very comforting, comfortable life. Comfortable means you can have a car, you can have a refrigerator, microwave, you know, all these type of the things that can come to you, are giving to you the comfort for a few minutes. But they don't give it to you the comfort for the life. When we're talking about farming, farming actually is the activity they can give it to you, happiness. Happiness, because we say in the Quechua ways, means you are going to be happy if you touch in the Mother Earth. Because Mother Earth giving to you every single thing you can think of. Giving to you the food, giving to you the medicine, and giving to you also the way we say relaxing. Because many of the people over here, we are under this stress. Stress because we cannot pay our bills, we cannot make in these things, etc. etc. I have to go so fast because I have only 20, 20 minutes to give it to you all what I bring to you to show you what we're doing in the, in the Pueblo of the Tezuke. Actually, you know, thank you very much to the, to the spirit of this. Uh, I bring this like, a, a, you know, when you go and see your girlfriend or your friend, you take a very nice flowers. But I bring to you what actually bring to me to this country. Maybe 40 years back, you didn't know this uh, wonderful plant, okay? It's I take care from Tezuke because we harvest this, uh, this guy. It's, you know, I tie very well, etc., etc. Don't look in the same as gold because the European people, they, when they come to America, they come and looking for gold and silver. And that's the way, actually, they kill into the indigenous people for take all these type of the things. Anyway, over here, if you look, this guy works is taking out from these bags, you know. But you can look it up, and you are going to see what's in this. Uh, I zap it up very well, you know, all this branch, all these type of the things. If you know this plant, probably you can tell me what is what is this. Okay, when somebody knows this plant, quinoa. that's quinoa actually. Okay, thanks to this plant, I come to this country four years back. I come to do my studies in Colorado University in quinoa. Okay, testing first because quinoa in my country was called indigenous food because only the indigenous people they can eat quinoa. But now, in these times, indigenous people we cannot eat quinoa. Why? because America, Japan, Germany, they asking to grow quinoa, okay? More quinoa, more quinoa. The price we pay over here, $3 or $4 a pound, in my country is not able for the indigenous people, they pay this price. 
Okay? But anyway, when I come over here, I bring more or less 250 different varieties of the quinoa to testing in different environments the response of the quinoa to this environment. Because it's much better to grow over here than bring quinoa from other places. Anyway, this is why I, I want to introduce you the spirit of this plant. Thanks to her, I come to this country. Okay? Anyway. <laughs> we can pass a little bit fast the slides because it's not much time in the way. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, it's technology to me making me a little bit crazy because <laughs> the green. Top button, yeah. yeah. Anyway, remember our history. I'm talking to you a little bit what's going on, what happened in the ancient times. Because when we're looking about science or technology, we can thinking how the people or the ancient people, it was actually thinking in the future of the humanity. Now we're thinking about the seventh generation. But our people in the ancient times thinking how we can preserve in this planet or this world, okay? This is how we start. When we have to plant things, we have to make in ceremony. I make in my ceremony the way my people doing in Pueblo of Tezuque. I have to ask him permission to the uh, governor and consul to give it to me the okay to make in my ceremony because we have to be connecting with the spirits to start any type of the activity. Maybe it's a, a little bit funny because, you know, when you go to college, you can't believe in this type of the things. Because we believe, indigenous people, we have a lot of belief in the power of the spirits. Because the spirits, they give it to you wherever you ask in them. If you are connecting with them, how you can connect with them? I don't know. But I have to pray in the morning. I have to pray in the night. I have to give it to her or to them all what I'm eating, what I am drinking. Many people over here, they like the chocolate. Also the spirits like chocolate. I have to give some chocolate to them too, okay? That's the initial initiation of the planting or harvesting when we have to make any type of this activity, okay? In my language, we don't say, for example, good morning or good afternoon or good evening. We say, ama sua, ama yulia, ama gela. Means, don't be lazy, don't lie, don't steal. And the answer is this, rampis kikillantag you be the same, okay? That was the way we greeting in the morning, in the night, or any time we can see your friend. Many of you probably, they travel to, the, to Peru, Bolivia, and we see over here these uh, terrazas. Actually, for the Inca people, this was like a climatological observatory. From the top to the bottom part, we hope from the highlands to the low elevation. Different type of the crops bring from different places, planting and checking which one is good and what elevation. And then from here, we have to put in different locations these crops where we growing. Here, I show to you one of the, my people the way they collect collecting seeds and exchanging seeds, or if they don't Exchanging seeds, they sell seeds in the market. We are still doing this activity in my country, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, part of the Colombia. But I will talk a little bit about the knowing our traditional seeds and plants. I mentioned to you, for example, quinoa. Potatoes was very, you know, many people thinking potatoes is coming from Ireland, but potatoes come from South America. In this moment, I want to say, for example, Indigenous people, they don't give in, they don't give in to the world, the gold or the silver. The indigenous people give to the world what we're eating, the food, the most precious or the most valuable thing for life, okay? Here, I can show you so many different type of the indigenous crops. It's Cañewa, Quinoa, Iwicha, it's the name of the amaranth for the indigenous people. Okay, that's the, in, the indigenous language, it is Iwecha and Quechua. In the ancient times, the Azteca people, they have a, the amaranth, one of the stable crops. 
But right now, for example, you are not going to find amaranth in, in, the, in Mexico. You are going to find in a small, like a cookies, or they call alegría, okay? When we talk about, for example, all these type of the things, the quinoa or, or cañiva or amaranth, you can begin to think in how valuable and how nutritious is this crop, okay? But we try to, we try to impose to the indigenous people, for example, wheat. Wheat was not originally from Central, South, or North America. It was corn, and then all these other grants were I showing to you, okay? And the, in the meantime, you can fund, or you fund these crops very high price. We cannot be accessible to the indigenous people, okay? Here I show you to the, the quinoa, but actually we have, for example, in some places, one of the very important things is this, this is dry land crop. But now we're trying to increase the yield in base of the different type of the technological aspects. More irrigation, we have to dig in for water, we have to look in for all the that other type of the aspects, we have to buy fertilizer, you know, all these type of the things. Things they can come in to bring to you dependable, the indigenous people in the way they have to grow his own crops, okay? <clears throat> That's the Cañoa dry land, okay? Very high in proteins, very good balance of the amino acids, any of these type of the things you can think in. How these people with no labs, they have the ability to making and selecting this type of the crops. Sometimes we're thinking, you know, that's one of the things we concentrate and realize, you know, in our collection in the seed bank in Pueblo of Tezuque. Probably our ancestors for thousands of the years, they making all what we're learning in college to have your title of the master's degree or your PhD when these guys, they're making already for thousands of the years selection of the crops for different type of the things, okay? Or nutritious or medicinal things. Don't think in quinoa is only nutritional grain, also has medicinal properties. I'm not going to talk in detail about this type of the things because they said to me, you have to talk to only for 20 minutes. Okay, but in other opportunity, we are going to have a chance to exchange more this type of the knowledge or experience with, with you. Okay, here is the, the head of the, of what? Amaranth, Amaranth, very similar to the quinoa. Different families, different species, etc. Okay, here we have different type of the crops. Okay, some squash, all this type of the things, also, coming from the indigenous land or indigenous selections, okay? Corns, we know, corn is coming from North, Central, and South America. You can, we say, indigenous people, we speak in the same food language, because when we eat in corn, you know, in Mexico they call Cali, in my country, Choclo, in North America they have corn. Okay, in English. But anyway, when we roast in corn, we, ho we call hanka in Mexico esquite. But it's almost the same type of the things. Every single place you can go and eat in this type of the things. But now you're eating in these little bags where it's called corn chips or potato chips. They are very healthy for you? No. But the, when you eat in the way we roast in corn and put it in packet, that's what I remember. When my grandmother or my mother put me this corn in my pocket, I have to eat that for the break, okay? It was more nutritious than eat the corn chips. Why? Because you don't know how long is in storage the corn chips. The, the, the corn are resorting is, is going to resort for one day or two days or one week. And then you eat eating and finish, okay? Anyway, it's, uh, I will talk a little bit about the herbal medicine. <clears throat> in many places, Right now, for example, we have problems of the cancer, many different types of the things. Sometimes we think in the technology, I am not against the technology, but we have to be very careful when we're using technology, okay? The chemotherapy, the radiation, all these types of the things, maybe in some ways they're making good to your body, but when sometimes they're killing so many of your cells or your health tissue you have in your body, okay? In Peru, 
in Brazil, part of the Bolivia, it's one plant, graviola. They're making research about this plant and found, for example, so many medicinal properties for stop the problem of the cancer, okay? Here, I can, you can see, we don't have a, people they can go to, to the medical school, we have the healers, they can have different types of abilities. Also, they have the knowledge to identify different types of the plants with the power. When we, have, when we have to harvest any of these plants, we have to know, we have to know when is the time, because all these plants also, they have the power in the function of the constellations. We can use and we can harvest specifically for some people and the time has to be delayed with this type of the things, okay? Here, we looking for different type of the crop, okay? Over here, we harvesting calendula. Yerba mansa, probably you know, it's a very good for the immune system. It you can delay with many different type of the illness. And then we are going to talk a little bit about the, how we're treating our traditional seeds, okay? Right now, we have so many problems, okay? In the 1960s, actually, we have the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution, they bring to you to using more fertilizer, more mechanizations, many other type of the factors in the way we are going to solve the solution or we are going to give the solution to the hunger of the world, okay? But that's not the answer. The answer is have, like you guys, every single small farmer, they can grow his own food. Because when we're growing our own food, we know what we're eating. When we go to the restaurant, we don't know what we're eating, okay? When you go to the store, you don't know what you're buying. How long is in the store? It's all these type of the things. I think people like you guys, they come to this type of the event, they have more inspiration. The, the same, myself, I have so much inspiration that when they pass, all these people, they pass away, okay? We have to follow this type of the things or this type of the lines, no? But anyway, you can see all these type of the things, they come in with this type of the mentality. But anyway, we say, we say, who controlling seeds is going to control in life. We have to be very careful about this type of the aspects. Last night, we have a very good event over here in this room when the people, they come in and exchanging seeds, taking seeds. You know, one of the best things we say is giving. In my language, we say, Hachuhuyu. we have to give, and we don't expect it. we are going to receive. Because in my language, we don't have, for example, thank you. What we have is, kutichiku hanchayu. Anyway, this is the guys, they beginning to controlling the seed production. If they control the seed production, they beginning or coming to control your own life, okay? We're talking about struggling, okay? People all the time in the indigenous lands, we are struggling all the time. This is one picture where I want to show to you and sharing with you how we can stop the cutting the trees, the trees in the rainforest. And probably you know a few weeks back or a few months back, Bolsonaro was turning and burning much of the rainforest. Our ex-president, Evo Morales, indigenous mentality, also they making a lot of damage to the environment. Burning the Tibnis, where it was actually one of the reserves of the natural reserves of the Bolivian population. Why? Because we want to grow crops that are not going to be healthy for the community or for the world, okay? Anyway, this is how sometimes people, they are going to stop the destruction of the mother nature. I will mention a little bit about the, you know, sometimes when I mention to you, we have, I have to make my offering or my, you know, my prey. I have to ask him permission to the governor and consul to make this type of the activity, okay? Because the Pueblo people, they have his own ways still making dance, still doing different type of the activities. Sometimes nobody they can go in to the Pueblo, nobody they can come in out. However, I work in the Pueblo of the Tezuke. Some days I cannot go in because they have his private things, okay? 
still practice this type of the things. Okay? Here in the Hopi prophecy, we know we have four races, the black, the red, the white, and the yellow. Okay? After these four principal days, we have some type of the crossing coming, etc., etc. Sometimes we're thinking, I am very indigenous pure. But I, probably I have some percentage of the African, who knows, okay? My DNA, it's very mixed with different type of the, the things, right? Here I have in Tezuke Pueblo, we are very lucky because we have the visit of the 13 grandmothers to blessing the fields and making things in the Pueblo of the Tezuke, okay? Here we are actually doing a ceremony to start the building of the seed, uh, the seed storage, okay? This guy is from Guatemala. We're making this offering because we know we, everything, think in this way, everything you have in life, it's only for the moment because this guy lent to you. Who knows? Maybe for one day, maybe for 10 years, maybe for 50 years, maybe for 100 years. But everything is only for the moment. Be very careful and respectful about the every single thing you have in this time. That's when you see me kissing the earth because I say thank you all the time. That's the way we are related with the, with the spirits of the mother nature, okay? Here it's one ceremony of the people in Mexico. They're making the ceremony for the corn and giving the thank you for half the corn or half the food in these times, okay? With they singing, they praying, all this type of the, the things. Traditional farming, but actually when we talk about traditional farming, I can say myself, this is the technique or this is the way for thousands of the years people practice and making survival and keeping in this type of the situation, okay? Hopis, for thousands of the years, dry land, no irrigation, no irrigation. And you see this cone, it's no more than three feet to four feet tall. Okay, and the size of the cone or the ears, it's very good comparable size, what we call the hybrids. Do you imagine how much money you have to expend in making hybrids? How much money you have to expend in making the GMOs? And these people, for thousands of the years, they're looking for the conditions, the conditions they can preserve your life and preserving your healthiness, okay? Beans, dry land, no irrigation, zero, zero, zero irrigation. Descend the quinoa coming, for example, from the dry land. Can you imagine they have to dig in the soil and planting until you find in the moisture and find, for example, the response and the crops they have. And they have actually very good yield and very good products for the end of the season, okay? Here, it's another very interesting. We're talking right now, for example, about the geothermal, geothermal technology. The people in the Andes, in the Titicaca Lake, they're planting his crops in between the Santa Pab, and then the same thing, the Mexican people, the Chinampas, in Hochimilco, they have almost the same or similar technique in the water, okay? Organic farming, we have to go for the organic certification and sometimes it's taking so much time to making all these type of the things. Indigenous people, we don't have organic certification. It was already organic since thousand years back because we don't have any chemicals. But now we have to have this type of the paper that can certify you are organic, okay? Pesticides, all the time, you cannot drink in water. Thousand years back, we drink in water anywhere, but now you have to buy your water. And water is going to come in one of the very, very hard things to get in this planet. Maybe it's going to cost more than this all oh, gasoline to put in your car because your body, they need this water to be alive, okay? 
Here we have one technique, it's vertical growth. This is Entesuke. We try to, 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 to see what other techniques we can use for, the crop, for growing different types of the crops. Because when you're talking, for example, about the food security, you have to begin to thinking what techniques you are going to use. Okay? Are we, I am not losing or I am not thinking to keep using the technique of the indigenous people. Dry land, preserving water, etc., etc. Okay? That's one of the harvests where we have. This is inside the hop house growing uh, apricots, cherries. Last year, thanks to the creator and the spirits, we have, a, we have actually a very, very, very successful year because we're growing more or less than 5,000 pounds of the apples, cherries, and other type of the things. I want to see very fast this type of the things because already they're flashing me for the time. And then we have over here different type of the crops. It's harvesting different type of the things, the hop house, okay? And then <clears throat> I would like to show to you the construction of the seed bank. I will close in with this type of the conversation with you because they're flashing me and they are probably they are going to charge me $500 for taking more <laughs> over time. <laughs> We're using the tire bells of the cars, okay? Each of these bells actually weighed one or 1.5 tons. Okay, this was the basement where we building the seed bank. Okay, over here we have people. I have people from Santa Cruz University or uh, They coming to do some work with us in the in the pueblo. They are actually they making the last plastering. Okay, we are using all local and recycled materials in this in this building. Okay, over here is almost part of the construction of the seed bank. Over here is already the upper area. And then over here, it's, you can see that's the design of the water snake because they have a lot of recognition for the water snake because we, we say this is the way the water is coming. And we're making ceremony special for the water snake in the Pueblo of the Tezuque. Sustainable energy, I will pass very fast. We have solar energy. And then over here in this other side, you can see we harvesting water, okay? It's solar dryer. And that's actually, you can see the, the two barrels of the almost very close to 5,000 gallons. We have storage water all collecting from the snow and the raining. And then this is the other part of the the hop houses or the geothermal technology we're using in the Pueblo of the Tezuque. It's also already we're trying to make the insulation for the temperature and saving seeds, proce processing seeds. You know, we have people from all over doing this type of the activity. That's the way we're making distribution to the elders of the food in the Pueblo. And we have the kids dancing and processing seeds. And that's actually different type of the crops you can see. And we have already over here the germination of the test, the, the seeds to see how efficient our storage or how is working our storage for seeds. Okay? You can see, for example, the vigorosity of the one of the seeds in the J germination. I want to say thank you very much to you for this time. And next question is to try to your hand. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Emigdio. So our second beyond successful farmer that I have the privilege to introduce, it's actually the Burroughs family. And Rosie will be representing Ward and her family. Uh, Ward and Rosie Burroughs, together with their children, are part of a family legacy of farming spanning over a century. The Burroughs family own and operate farms in, San, in California's San Joaquin Valley and southeastern Oregon. Burroughs Family Farms is the marketing flagship of all the organic products from Full Circle Dairy, 
California Cloverleaf Farms, Burroughs Family Orchards, and CCF Sullivan Ranch, including almonds, beef, cheese, free-range pastured chickens, grass-based dairies, eggs, seasonal meat birds, and olives. Over the past 17 years, they've converted all of their farms to organic. Woo! The boroughs use regenerative agricultural practices to improve soil fertility by focusing on nourishing soil biology and increasing biodiversity. In 2016, Rosie and Ward Burroughs co-founded the California State University Chico Regenerative Agriculture Initiative, now known as the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Resilient Systems. I had a chance to speak with Rosie on the phone and asked her, what advice do you have for us today? She said, farm with one goal of following the golden rule. Treat other people the way you would want to be treated and farm with all the love you have in your heart. Rosie resonates with the words mother, nurturer, healer, provider, and protector. Let's all welcome Rosie. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the invitation to share our family farm story. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to be with you today. And we have loved the total positive energy that we receive at this conference every year. We are organic farmers using regenerative, ecological, biological practices. Our journey has been filled with joy and love of living and working on the farm. At times we've had challenges and felt discouraged and disappointed. We are sharing our story today to offer hope encouragement, support, and connection while holding positive intentions of being the change that is needed to save our planet, the broken food system, and we are all called to be part of this solution. We are stewards of the land. It is spiritual, it is sacred. It is our responsibility to nourish, protect, and preserve the land we have been entrusted with. Farming for us is about working with nature. Okay, thank you. Is with working with nature to enhance the soil biology, manage the resources of plants and animals, to ensure the highest and best use of land for all life. We are all connected to one another and to all life. We must make decisions with our head, our heart, and our soul for the whole, now and for the future. Our roots come from a rich heritage of ranching and farming. My parents were from New Mexico with Spanish Basque, Native American, Irish, Mexican, and French descent. My love of nature and horses sent me on my path to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, where I met and married my husband, Ward. Ward's farm family history in California starts with his grandfather, Benjamin, in 1894. He came out from Illinois, and in 1906, he started the family dairy in Knights in California. Over the next 50 years, there were several partnerships that formed. And I'll mention a few here, you may have heard them because they were still being sold in, even in the, two, in the year 2000. Walnut Grove Farm, Blue Ribbon Farms, Cloverleaf Farms, and Burroughs Brothers Farms. It was all about processing and marketing milk and milk products. This was the first certified raw dairy in California. 
Raw milk was bottled on the farm and shipped via Santa Fe to Oakland for distribution. This is the home ranch uh, farm in Knightson around 1940, and milk cows and heifers were grazed on pastures. On-farm processing came to an end later in the 60s, and the Burroughs Brothers Partnership ended in 1970. We started our family partnership with Ward's father and brother in 1974 in a diversified, conventional farm of beef, dairy, and farming, and it continued in both Knights and Merced for nearly 30 years. We diversified to almonds in the 80s, and this partnership ended in 2004. It was bittersweet, and it was very scary to split and not know how we were going to create income. But it, as it is said, when one door closes, God always has another one to open. The business split gave us the opportunity to start partnerships with our children. And I'm going to share with you some of the vision and missions of each partnership. They're all in separate individual farms, but we also work collaboratively and collectively. Today, all four of our children are in ranching and farming. We have started our succession planning of passing down the farm to each one of the farm partnerships. We hope to complete this process this year. Our first partnership with our children started in 2000 with our daughter, Christina. It is an organic, seasonal, grass-based dairy. And this was a huge paradigm shift. It actually took us four years to get our partners to allow us to start this type of business. Ward's father said, why in the hell would you want to go backwards 200 years? <laughs> we had been partners in the highest production dairy in our county of Merced. And in one year, it was the state, and in that year, it was of the nation. We were from high inputs to grass-based dairying, the complete opposite of the goal of high production. Now we were concentrating on the health from the soil up and using holistic management by taking cows back to nature, grazing cows as they were meant to be. Christina and her husband, Brian, have four children, and today their farm, Full Circle, is a diversified, organic, dairy, beef, chickens for eggs, and a few other projects, including pigs. On the top left picture is one of our test projects of keeping the calves on with their mothers. All of our children have grown up with the responsibility of raising and caring for animals. Our eldest grandson, Jed, on the right top, is 16 years old today and has his own enterprise of 2,000 free-range pasture-based hens. <laughs> Full Circle Dairy Mission. I wanted to share this, and I'm not going to read all of each individual farm mission, but it tells you a lot of what our goals and aspirations are as a family farm. That the entire Full Circle Dairy the whole dairy team, might be instrumental in the production of wholesome, organic, grass-based food products, raise our children in a nurturing and enriching environment, give back to our community through education and involvement, glorify God in all we do, especially as stewards of his land, and at the beginning and end of each day, we take time to celebrate and appreciate the gifts we've received. Burroughs Family Orchards, the next partnership, was formed with our daughter, Benina, who's here today with Eriberto and the four children. <clears throat> Burroughs uh, Family Orchards has diversified to all organic almonds, olives, meat birds, and eggs. Benina manages 1,000 acres of organic almonds. Our daughter, Benina, I love this picture, 
has been the force that has been the foundation to support, encourage, and help all our farms transition to organic. All our farms are certified organic. Thank you. <clears throat> Benina and her husband, Eriberto, established and have grown the organic egg business of 3,000 birds to graze across all our farms. Mobile chicken units are used on all parts of the farm, from the dairy pastures, the orchards of almonds and olives, and all our native lands. Burroughs Family Orchard Mission, and I'm going to just skip down to the very bottom part of it, is we promise to enhance the family business through honesty, integrity, fairness, and respect, while caring for and developing the land, its people, and its resources. California Cloverly Farms was formed in 2004 with our son Zeb and his, Meredith, and his wife Meredith. This was our first for, farm that we certified organic, a 500 cow seasonal grass-based crossbred Jersey dairy designed with a New Zealand style dairy barn. Our first introduction to holistic management intensive grazing was from Stan Parsons, Alan Savory, and Dave Pratt in Ranching for Profit over 40 years ago. Our beef experience then was implemented to our dairy designs. The symbiotic relationship between cattle, grass, and land utilizes open space and for improving and protecting our invaluable watersheds. Both of our dairies are designed New Zealand style, both in the milking barn and calf rearing. Calves are raised in groups of 12 to 15 and run in paddocks, learning to graze from an early age. Our heifers are our future. For us, we concentrate on good nutrition. We use no milk replacer. We take it straight out of our, our organic milk tank. Calves have room to run and play, socialize in group settings with fresh grass to graze daily. CCF has diversified to all organic beef, chicken, pigs, sheep, and goats. All of creation under our stewardship are nurtured with love, care, and kindness. When we had difficulty in sourcing quality organic hay, we expanded to Oregon. We purchased the CCF Sullivan Ranch in 2013. We felt it was a good opportunity to have property in another state to prepare for the future because we didn't know what's going to happen with our water. We have several different fields of organic hay, including alfalfa and pasture blends. We have been using a no-till drill to overseed. We rotate the field with animal grazing after the haying. This ranch was run down, and it took a great deal of investment for repairs and solar. We are, we are very blessed to work with this land to heal and restore it to good health. We have a perfect location, great water aquifer, and wonderful neighbors. We use beef and sheep to ro rotationally graze the forest, and we couldn't do it without these magnificent guard dogs. We have an amazing amount of wildlife in the forest bear, cougar, wolves, etc. The guard dogs work in pairs. Generally, one stays in the middle of the herd or the flock, and the other circles a larger peri perimeter to protect from predators as much as 10 miles away. California C Cloverleaf's mission, again, I'm not going to read the whole one because of, short of being short of time, but I will add the one line that I wanted to share with you, which is to celebrate life livestock and our agriculture livelihood to take time for outreach, education, and community involvement. Burroughs Family Farms is the marketing flagship for all of the family's products produced. The next set of slides are composite pictures from farms over the last 20 years. We have been blessed to raise our children on the farm and delight in the joys of being grandparents with grandchildren following the love of our fa family legacy. Uh, did something happen with that slide? Oops, let me, there we go. Sorry, I, I didn't remember I had to do this. 
Okay. Boy, that is over 20 years. Okay. I got Okay, so uh, check out the one right in the middle. That's uh, one of our granddaughters, Wilhelmina. I just love that picture with her, with her hugging her chicken. And I do want to take time just to um, go to the far, uh, your far left picture, the middle picture with the bald eagle. Um, uh, we have blessed our land throughout the years with shaman and very holy people. And we do uh, offer uh, thanksgiving and blessings. And I, I didn't have this in my notes, but I loved everything you said. And our Native American spirits that live on our farm um, have um, asked us, asked me to give um, some tribute to them. So they've asked for specific honey to be put on acorn caps, which I present to them in their location. I love our almond butter, our organic soaps. <clears throat> because we did have to cut our, our, our time short, I'm just really going to fly through these. Oh, let me go back to this one. This is an important part that I have to say. We stopped marketing our Burroughs Family Farmers Milk products in the winter, this last winter of 2019. I mentioned a broken food system earlier. The organic dairy industry is in dire trouble throughout the nation. And we are in the process of closing our California Cloverleaf Farms dairy. Financially, the pay price to farmers is not sustainable. We've been involved in research projects for over 50 years. And one of the most recent ones was mentioned to you in another uh, plenary speaker with Dr. Jonathan Lundgren. And the preliminary results are astonishing of comparing uh, regenerative farm practices to conventional farm practices. We are very proud and at the top of our list of passionate projects of being part of the development of the Center for Regenerative Ag at CSU Chico. The center is a full spectrum of education from soil to shelves, a beacon of light globally for shining the light on best practices for regenerative ag, including research, demonstrations, and farmer-to-farmer -farmer education. Our family for 55 years consecutively hosted students from Japan and Brazil and a few other countries that started after World War II with the Farm Bureau. We were no longer able to continue this program due to loss of housing to host students. And students generally stayed with us for uh, a year to a year and a half at a time. And there are three farms in Japan named after our farm. I'd love to tell you more. This is a field of young almond trees and every other row is planted with a different mix of cover crops. This was the first slow food journey held outside of Rome in 2008 in San Francisco. And our farm was, was one of the uh, host farms. And the speakers for this event were Joel Salatin and Jerry Brunetti, titled All Flesh is Grass. We are grateful to all our mentors and healers, including EcoFarm and CalCan. These programs have, have helped us along our journey. I love the cinematography of Deborah Coons Garcia and her documentary, Symphony of the Soil. We have hosted farm tours on the farm since the early 1900s. I have some little buttons and all kinds of old stuff from, from the early days of farm tours. To the right of this picture are a new first year almond trees planted, which is important to share with you that they are grown organically from day one. This is Ward with his dad and his family in a 1950s parade. We make our own compost. We use onion and garlic skins mixed with purchased cow manure and our own on-farm cardboard and paper. Ward calls his compost, I gotta go one more. Oh, I, I didn't move fast enough, black gold.
For the last three years, we have been making Dr. David Johnson's bioreactor compost. We have been using this fungal compost to make compost tea, which is then fertigated in the almond orchards. We use cover crops on all our orchards and farm ground. Planting a diversity of cover crops is one of the five regenerative egg practices that help regenerate the life of the soil. This is a picture of, of an almond orchard that was taken out of production and planted with a cover crop. Here the cows are brought in to graze. Regenerative farming systems consider the earth and strive to heal and improve the health by using responsible land, water, and animal management. And as it was said earlier throughout this uh, conference, we don't have all the answers, but we need to strive to continue to work on it. Our whole almond uh, orchard recycling is, is a new practice. We grind the trees and spread back to promote organic matter for soil fertility and water retention. The last three plantings of almond, or of almond trees are being developed with a longer tree trunk for catch bass harvesting. This will change the industry and make it easier for farmers to use cover crops and deal with that during harvest. This will also greatly help with the air quality. Yeah. Managing our grasslands, thank you. Managing our grass, grasslands correctly is the key to the future of our water supply. As part of one of the five practices for regenerative ag, we are experimenting during the spring using our animals to graze in the orchards. These are dairy heifers. These are sheep in the almond orchard, sheep in the solar sites. We graze chickens on all of our farms, through the dairy pastures, in the almond and olive trees, and in our solar sites. Here, Ediberto with his son Ward early, with early morning fog, and I love the little picture on the corner with the guard dog with the chickens. <laughs> Working lands and hedgerows. Our farms were part of a research project with the Nature Conservancy from Merced County. And these maps were created to show cover cropping, hedgerows, and riparian restoration. We plant a diversity of plants for the cover crops in new orchards with a no-till in the fall and a no-till planting in the pastures twice a year for summer and fall feed. We have planted miles of hedgerows across all farms, between borders, between blocks of trees, along the roads, and in orchards. We have used a combination of native plants oak trees, fruit trees, flowering trees, shrubs, flowers, and we have something in bloom for beneficials every day of the year. I just had to throw this gal in. I just love Ceanothus. Deer grass, red bud, are just a few of the plants we use for basket weaving pictured here with Julia Parker, renowned Native American master basket weaver. We are a monarch way station. Our farm has practices, patches of native milkweed across all our farms. Biologist Aaron Winsel has been monitoring the native plants on our farm. Restoration projects on the creek, hillsides, hedgerows, and return ponds. The picture to the right is a nice stand of native grass, and the picture on the bottom left is rare to find on the valley floor, um, a collection of native Chinese houses. Our farms, in, on our farms, we have created a sanctuary for wildlife, especially for migratory birds. We have new species landing on our farm every year, including a great horned owl who lives year round and a bald eagle that uh, bald eagles that come during the winter. And we have blessed the land throughout the years and have created medicine wheels and energy wheels across all farms. 
Thousands of Western ladies, butterflies, worked the cover crops flowers during last spring. We invent, I should have go back to that one. I just take a moment just to really uh, be in awe of, of the bees and the butterflies. I, I love the picture in the middle. Benina took that picture. We have invested a large amount of financial capital to develop 11 solar sites across the farms in Merced County and six solar sites on, on the Oregon Ranch. Giving back to the community as part of our family legacy, ha Run Happy, Be Happy is our annual 5K run and proceeds go to Planet B and the Center for Regenerative Ag at CSU Chico. Two other projects that that our family has taken on are the SLD Foundation that promotes awareness of dyslexia and the Apraxia Foundation. In closing, I'll let you read these quotes for a minute. And I'm not sure if everyone could read in the back, so that wasn't fair of me to do that. It is the soil that nourishes and provides for the whole of nature and the whole of creation depends on its soil, which is the ultimate foundation of our existence. And a nation that destroys itself, <clears throat> that, that destroys its soil, destroys itself. <clears throat> As we come now to winding down to this close, healthy soil sequesters carbon. Creating health can save the planet. It takes an open mind, an open heart, and the courage to take the risk to change your paradigm of farming. Our family's farms are designed and operated with simplicity, using nature as God intended, concentrating on the environmental, economical sustainability for our land, our cattle, and ourselves. Our stewardship of the land starts first with organic regenerative practices, which protect, preserve, and enhance the health of all life on our farms, starting with the microbes in the soil to the birds in the sky, including air and water. <clears throat> all are interconnected. All are interrelated. We are blessed to live and work on the farm where we see the beauty of God's creation and the everyday miracles of life. And I leave you with this blessing that we put together uh, over 40 years ago. May the water in the creeks you cross run clear and cold. The mountains you climb be blanketed with snow and the meadows you reach be covered with green grass. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, that brought me to tears. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all are awesome. All right, I'd, I'd like to introduce our uh, final Beyond Successful Farmer for this morning, Scott Park from Park Farming Organics in Meridian, California. Scott Park and his family farm 1,700 organic acres in the Sacramento Valley. The main crops are processing tomatoes, rice, corn, wheat, barley, dry beans, alfalfa, vine seed crops, squash, cauliflower, as well as various experimental crops, hemp, quinoa, stevia. Scott started his farming career in 1974 as a first generation farmer with a political theory degree. Some of the best kinds of farmers. The first 11 years were spent cloning what neighbors did, but observing the decline in soil quality along with increased chemical and fertilizer inputs led Park to, shift, to begin shifting his focus from conventional solutions to natural inputs in 1986. 
The farm struggled in these early years of transition without a model, but today the farm represents a successful organic farm system that has similar size, crops, and yields to conventional California farms. The farm continues to evolve as the family tweaks the system to minimize inputs and lets healthy soil and the surrounding environment do the problem solving for the farm. I had a chance to chat a little bit with Scott over the phone, and I was really impressed with his, uh, the relationships he has with his coworkers, many who've been working with him for 38 or more years. And when I asked for his advice, he said, simply take care of the soil and it will take care of the plant. And when I asked him, well, what gets you up in the morning? He says, for the last 38 years, I've enjoyed waking up every single morning. Well, maybe except a couple times when I might have been a little bit hungover. Let's welcome up Scott. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me speak. I don't feel like a successful farmer, but if you want to give me that credit, I'll take it. I'm not proud. So I guess the validity of, of my presentation is uh, maybe a ray of hope that there's a better way to farm in California and the United States and the world. That the system, we've stumbled into this system that the way we're farming, so this is going to be a pretty practical presentation. But, but the heart of it is, is, is I think everybody in this room knows the agriculture's gone in the wrong way and it's continuing to go in the wrong way. So that's why I use the term there, a normal California farm farmed abnormally, is that our farm is basically like a lot of large California farms. We grow crops like a lot of California farmers do. Um, the difference is that, that we've evolved in this system that soil health is, is the boss and soil health defines our, the way we farm and what we do. And so I'm going to touch on super quick because we are running behind um, the uh, why the farm changed and then I'm going to spend time, again this is on the practical side, what are we doing that, that makes it work? What are our inputs? And then quickly I'll hit on results and move on. Okay. Uh, let's see, is this working? Yeah. Do I sound okay? Okay, good. Okay, so yeah, this is our farm team. We're, we're just a simple sole proprietorship. It's just myself, my son, Brian, my wife, Ula. So we're it, um, along with a really good crew, a lot of really good people that we work with. But right now, as time marches on for me, Brian has pretty much taken over the farm. <laughs> I, I'm somewhat of a scout or a consultant if he wants to listen to me, but uh, he, he usually does just because he knows how many times I've screwed up and he want, doesn't want to do the same that I did. Okay. So thanks to Apocalypse Now, this was our farm model when we first started in 1974. Okay. The, uh, when I started farming, I had absolutely no idea about farming at all. I, I had actually been working on the farm in college, but it was just bucking bales, moving stray hay and alfalfa. And the, uh, the, the person I was working for I, when I graduated from college, and I actually started doing some graduate work in philosophy, but I was pretty burnt out on the whole college scene. So he asked me to go into partnerships growing, this was 1974. Why don't you grow processing tomatoes with me? And I know you don't have any money. I'll give you 20% of the net and all the beer and peanut butter sandwiches you need to make it through the season. What a deal. Immediate agreement. <laughs> so so that's, how, that's how I got going. And uh, so I, up to, into the, I'll hit on, I'm not going to spend because we're time. But in 1985, so I've been farming for 11 years, and, and and I started finally figuring out that this is really a bad system that's in. It's like the ground was getting harder. I was using bigger equipment, bigger rippers, trying to loosen up the ground. It was basically managing boulders and crushing them down, trying to make it into a seed bed. And, and so I got on this field, and the ground worked beautifully, and it wasn't a, a field I'd farmed before, but I, the farmers that were farming it, I reflected on how they were doing and what they were doing, and their approach was way different. Super mellow, very light equipment, 
good rotation, thoughtful timing on when they worked it, and we're, in my world of just chemical and tillage power overwhelming anything you didn't like, these people are getting really good results with a sense of touch, okay, instead of a sense of human power blowing through it. So times moved on, but, and I started transitioning ground, I started going organic, and, and, and basically by 1995 till now, it's just been this constant process of serendipitous results, meaning I wish when I started on this, just so I think I'm smart, but I know better, that, that I knew what I was doing or where I was going to go. All I knew is where we didn't want to go, okay? But how we got to where we are was, was totally just fortunate discovery by accident. And, and, and I think for young farmers, in, in my world, the most valuable thing is observation, okay? Observation, seeing your farm, like I see almost, you know, I have 26 fields spread over 10 miles, and I pretty much see every field at least once a day, if not twice a day. And, and that's the way that you can learn. And you also, I also highly recommend record keeping. Like I have, in, in the, I'm going into my 47th year and I've recorded every day, every operation done in every field, okay? And so it's really handy, even five, I find myself sometimes five and 10 years later, I'm going back as something flashes in my mind, why did this do this, why was this? And it really helps you make solid decisions because in farming, there's so many variables. And how do you draw an intelligent conclusion? And the other value of that is we constantly have trials going. Okay, so right now I would say we probably have 15 different trials going. And it's just that comparative value that because of all the variables, it's hard to say yes. We're on to something, okay? But, but you can say that if, if you're doing trials and you're th saying things side by side. But the other thing in here is, the, of course, no roadmap, but there on the bottom, without realizing it, that's the heart of it. We didn't know it. We, all we knew was that we had to solve problems before they happened. It, but there's better uh, organic insecticides and fungicides now than there was in this time period. So I, I'm not, I think like uh, Marone, uh, the biocontrols and stuff, I don't use them, but I hear that they're better. But back in this earlier time frame, it was glorified water, okay? So you could just spray until you're purple in the face an organic insecticide and it didn't do anything. You know? And so we realized, if we don't put ourselves in that situation. And so this is what drives the farm, okay? The farm is go with the flow of nature, solve problems before they happen, but without knowing it, the way we found to solve problems before they happen is just respect soil, take care of it, build it up, don't abuse it, and then let it do all the problem solving, okay? So we're gonna sprint through here. So my seven-year-old grandson, put this together for me, okay? Wow. So, <laughs> not really. But, so this is the crux of the farm. And I, I, I talked to uh, groups from, mostly it's the University of California, Davis, of classes, and, and I, I kept on trying to figure out, I gotta give some order to these talks I'm giving because the kids are, or students are used to order. So this is what I came up with, and as these are, the bottom is the inputs, okay? So for our farm system, we respect, and I call it the nine C's, and the nine C's are driven by cover crops, crop rotation, and conservation tillage. Those are the three keys. On the side of it, more is crop residue, conserving your inputs, crew care, and then on the other side is the controlled traffic, compost, and critter care. And some of these, like the critter cover, probably should be called border management, but that doesn't have a C in it, and I like <laughs> order, okay? So, and then up above, so if you're doing that which is in the bottom, the inputs, and you have a symbiotic relationship also, just that's the yellow arrows going back and forth, because it's not just this way, it's also the plant helping the soil. But if you do this, then you get your plant help. Okay, and that's, that's the core then of all the benefits. By the plant health going, now your yields are solid. Your quality is, is probably, the, I think, the biggest impact of what we're doing. Yes, 
I do need profit, I can't take care of the environment, I can't take care of my crew if I'm not making money, uh, but your soil structure changes, your inputs shrink, your press pressures pretty much disappear, your water retention is unbelievable, and your plants are resilient to the, the whims of Mother Nature. Okay, so if you do this, you get this, and then this on the periphery is what I'm hoping is happening. But again, I can't quantify it, but I think it's a goal that, that all farmers should have. And I, I do say this to some groups is that, but I'm really careful with the, the conventional farmers, but like I feel of our 26 fields, every field gets better every year, okay? So if every farmer had it where every field's getting better every year, that's gonna be a really positive for both their pocketbook, the planet, and people. So cover crops, we shoot for having life 365 days a year. Like right now on the 1,700 some acres, every field's green, okay? Some of it's 200 acres of its alfalfa, the rest of it's cover crops. We don't, we, over time, we put 10 to 15 tons of biomass in the ground of every acre every year, and that's a combination of, of crop residue, compost, and, and cover crops. But, but the whole idea is the system never goes to sleep, that we, that we are constantly making the land healthier, particularly under the ground, and then let that do the work for us. So showing you a nightmare, this is uh, this 2019 when we couldn't get on the ground for five months. And, uh, and in our situation, we have to, like if you can imagine on a Monday, we have this condition, and on a Tuesday morning, we're sticking tomato transplants in the ground, okay? It's, it's like, it's definitely a challenge. So some years we get burned from our practices and, and we're farming on, on, as I, you know, it's a really high scale. Like we're, this, like 2019, we were shooting to deliver 25,000 tons of tomatoes, okay? And, and, and we fell short, it was a rough year. And some of the rough year was because of this. I just want to point out, you know, that tractor is probably close to eight feet tall. And this is volunteer mustard, totally blowing away, okay? So I, I'm gonna hit on this. I, we have a workshop this afternoon and a lot more of the relationship of timing, of cover crops to planning, um, I'm gonna spend time on. So the second C is crop rotation. It's, this is all just common sense. You know, we, we're mixing it up 100%. You know, we'll go from a grain, a grain to a vegetable, to back to a cereal, to a legume. The whole time we're mixing it, we, we want to have, we want to have a plants with a lot of biomass, and we want to have like growing melons for seed, then we're going, and in between each one of them, we're planting as the, uh, is cover crops in between. So like the wheat comes off, which I'll hit on later, we're coming in and planting a summer cover crop behind it. So the, the, the diversity is super good for the ground, but it's also good for the pocketbook as it spreads our risk through, through a variety of crops. So this is a, a third C of conservation tillage. This was this year, again, these are tomato transplants going in. This is what I just referenced to the seven foot tall biomass. I guarantee there was no field in California for processing tomatoes that had this much biomass. Um, mostly because everyone else is smarter and they don't get themselves in this position. But we made it, the crop actually, this, this turned out fine. It didn't turn out quite as well as it should have. The, um, the targeted tillage is, is just like this it has had no disturbance. Only the strip till for, to warm the ground up. But other than that, we basically just, just uh, chopped it, moved some of the biomass out of the way and planted, okay? Whereas when we have an opportunity for no-till, we'll do it, okay? No, and there's a long, I could do hours on tillage to no-tillage, but when, when it fits our farm, we'll do it. Like this is rice where we just chopped it, we're just going in with a no-till drill and drilling, and this was what it looks like, um, like a month and a half later, as you can just see, barely see the rows of vetch coming through. So this is what crop residue and rice looks like. Here's my seven-year-old grandson again, setting me straight, okay? I, we're like, what are you gonna do with all this stuff? And that's, that's what we do. With that stuff, we chop it to this and we come to this. 
So the, the fifth C, and I know a lot of you are on a smaller scale, so you're not dealing with GPS and sub one inch, but on the scale I'm at, the, uh, the efficiencies from technology and GPS is, is wonderful. So this tractor runs, this is your waviness or furrows, okay? So like this is a furrow, this is a bed, furrow. And, and, and these are the same furrows from 10 years ago. The tractor's running on the exact same path it ran 10 years ago. So the advantage of that is that approximately only 30% of the ground that we're farming gets pressed down. Okay, so the rest of it, we're letting the soil and the system do. The reason we do it is if we don't loosen it up, we're going to fight that on and on. And almost none of our crops are being grown in the furrow, but that ripper comes up and it lifts and it breaks this. All the rest of it is the targeted tillage. We'll, we'll till two inches deep in order to get the compost incorporated. And then that's all that we're doing on tillage, okay? Better to do none, but this is the, what we have to do. So the seven C, this is sort of the culmination of, of if we're doing everything else right, this is, this is what we get, and which I think organic farming, regenerative farming, sustainable farming, whatever it is, your goal is minimalism. Your goal is setting it up so that the, the natural processes can do what they can do, and you're not in pushing and manipulating adding more water, trying to time little intricate placements of fertilizer and what have you. Once we plant, we pretty much don't do anything for like this growing period is four months, okay, for tomatoes. We'll plant, we'll cultivate, and we'll irrigate, and we'll let it grow. We don't, we don't want to get in the way. We don't want to over-irrigate. We don't want to put too many plants. We don't want to pump it up with nitrogen, and, and we just till as little as possible. So this is a good example, because this is going back the year before. You can see the corn. You can see there's plenty of space between the plants. This is, the plants are actually, this is in May, the first week of May. We can go, because of our soil structure, we'll go 40 some days not irrigating after we put the transplants in the ground because of the water retention. Just to fill it, a, a tomato processing season is 120 days, give or take three or four in either direction. Normal farmers are irrigating the day, day they plant, and they're irrigating up to two weeks before harvest. We're cutting the water 30 to 40 days before harvest, and we're not having to irrigate for 30 to 40 days on the front side after we plant. 100% because of excellent soil structure from taking care of the soil. So the, the eight C's are, are crew care, yeah, we, these are dear people to the farm, and, and they're super critical to the farm. This is, what, this is what's so important. Each of these guys, we, we don't have any hierarchy. We don't have foremen or managers or this or that. You know, it's, it's, it's everyone's in there, and so it cuts down a lot of backbiting and fighting, and they're all paid very well, and, and we, you know, almost all of them can weld, but they can all cultivate and irrigate, so we just have interchangeable parts. And everyone feels like, you know, they're equal with everyone else. It's just, it's a good working environment. And you can have a lot of stress, especially working in 100 degree heat, moving sprinkler pipes at two in the afternoon. You know, you're not always in the best mood. <laughs> and the 9C is the critter care or border management. About five or six years ago, we just started realizing that 
we're blowing it. We, 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 we've got so much more that we can be having around the field to help the system run. And, and the idea of just going and disking the borders and stuff like that, we eliminated. Now we just we try as much as possible to have things growing. But we still do battle gophers and we still we, we manipulate a little bit. We, we put up predator perches and we put up owl boxes. However, I will say that over time, our gopher and squirrel problem is probably about half of what it used to be or less. It's, it's almost to the point where we don't even think about it anymore, okay? So that's, that's, our, that's the inputs, okay? And here's results. How am I doing on time? Please wrap up. That speaks for itself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> really quick on this, okay? So we've had tests done by OFRF, Organic Farming Research Foundation. As, as I, 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 I've talked a lot with uh, professors at UC Davis and we never have any any pest pressure. So they said, okay, you're talking the talk, let's see if you can walk the walk. Basically, they took my soil and, and they tested it against four other so soils in the area. They covered the plants with a net, put beet leaf hoppers under it. Oh, and on this one, yeah, I'm one ahead. Sorry, on this one, this is just a 45 day cutoff and I've already touched on this. So we're getting 62 tons cutting the water 45 days before harvest and normal. That's not every year, but on this trial, which is why I'm showing it. it, it we look really good, okay? <laughs> so th this is uh, also, th this is being grown, telling how healthy the soil is. This is a rice field that we're growing with no inputs other than cover crops. This has had nothing added to it for two years, okay? And, and, and I've been growing for this, the Shumei Natural Agriculture, and, and, and touching on the spiritual side, I, I am spiritual, but I kind of keep it to myself. But, but they base, they want the farmer, they be, feel the spirit of the farmer, water, air, and earth is all that you need to grow, okay? So that's why I'm growing for this people. But the interesting thing was, is I was expecting crop disasters without any inputs, okay? We were actually, this this the same crop, we were yielding uh, 5,000 power, five, yeah, 5, 500 pounds more per acre than conventional rice fields, loading it up with every input, okay? That, the, that the, the life of the soil can get it done. The same thing on taking care of the nitrogen in your inputs. Again, just worry about the 4.4. So we had a trial done, like I like to put the, the compost on in the fall, to kind of be sure to get it all assimilated coming into the spring. And, and we have a lot of compost that we're putting down. We don't want to be jammed and running heavy equipment, yada, yada. Okay, so anyway, they tested, this was in 2019, super wet year. The, and this is how far in kilograms per hectare, if it means anything, between controlled dairy manure and, and chicken, chicken litter. Okay, it's 4.4. Comparison to Russell Ranch, which is on UC Davis, beautiful dirt, organic tomato, and that WCC is a winter cover crop. This is the, the it's here, 4.4 to 7.2. Almost, what, half, th third more? Then nor, another field, organic field, they're losing. This is how much, it's 15 kilograms. This is how much you're losing down. It's showing how our ground is working as a sponge. And then if you just want to make sure you get you know, nitrogen in the groundwater, you do what they're doing in New Mexico. <laughs> so the same thing talking, I have no, in, in 10 years of growing, you know, up to 20 crops a year, this is spread over the 1,700 acres, we, we have almost zero insect problems. We have fields blow up, we've had like four fields that we've lost. We lost one in 2019, but it was six acres. So yeah, it goes wrong, but it's for all those fields, for all that's going on, to have that little pressure, it tells you your soil's doing the work. And this is what I, when I ref originally referenced, let the soil solve your problems. Solve the problems before they happen, take care of the soil, and it's eliminating this whole layers of stuff that you've got to put to it. So anyway, these are insect hits on the plant. This is compared to the rest of them. You can see it just blew them out of the water. So water retention, these are both my fields. The difference is this one I just picked up in the fall. This one had been in, in my way of farming for 10 years. We got heavy rains. These are two fields within a half mile of each other. Both fields were planted to a cover crop. Look at the difference of after an inch of rain. I saw this mess, bye-bye cover crop. I drove a half mile over to this one. 
which is all the only difference, same dirt, everything else is just 10 years of taking care of the dirt. Right. So on healthy soil, it's just, and this, is, this was taken last winter too in super wet conditions. This is clay ground and yet we are still getting aggregation. Okay, it's still friable, it's still alive with earthworms. You've got, you're seeing all the decomposition to it. A normal farmer, this might look horrible. To me, it's heaven. It's like this system is alive, it's jacked up. It's got all the different forbs, it's got grasses, it's got legumes, things breaking down. You know, it's a good environment to grow crops. Resilience, just so, again, side by side, conventional farmer. He got 20 sacks to the acre a mile up the road, really wet winter, 2017, I got 45. More than double, he loaded it up with ammonium sulfate, every fungicide on the earth that could be flown on wheat, it didn't matter. The, the ground was dead, couldn't take care of the plant. We're, we're, there's more and more, as mentioned, wheat, where you just go in and we take the crop off, we chop it, we pre-irrigate it. We do have good water in Northern California, so it's a luxury. I'm glad, thankful that we have it, that we can do it. Where down south, it's harder where you don't have as much water. But for us, it really helps because now this is the, the goats and the, the summer cover crop, that's our tillage. That's working the ground deep. That's loosening it up, plus all the advantages of the animals, okay? So that, that's this side of it. We pretty much, I'm out of here. The only thing what we're, uh, I do want to mention this nutrient density. If we want to move the target, if we want to get consumers thinking different, corporations, government, academia, it's always thrown in my face, organic can't feed the world, okay? And my argument to them that people don't need to eat as much if they're eating good food, okay? So the, the nutrient density, if, if you have academia and you can push it, it will really help what we're trying, all of us here are trying to accomplish. But really what I'm trying to accomplish for our farm is at some point it's all so mellow, it's all running so smooth that we can just back off and let nature do its thing. Where the power of nature left undisturbed. <laughs> Thank you very much.